research staff member from IBM. She came here all the way from California just for us. Um, at least we gave her a nice weather. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. She has more than 20 years of experience in database systems and data integration, and she's worked on discovery-driven integration design and mapping technology for information integration. She thinks that she might be the oldest PhD student, but I would take issue with that. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, I have to say I really enjoyed the uh, panel that we just went through. Um, I've been a data nerd for over 20 years and a Star Trek Next the Generation fan for that long, so it's really awesome to hear you all talking about big data. So what I want to do for you today is talk a little bit about what big data means to me and to my institution. I'm actually from the Omidyar Research Center, which is out in Silicon Valley. It's kind of the birthplace for relational databases a couple of decades ago. It's how I ended up in California. I actually started my graduate work at the University of Wisconsin, good data school. Um, and then the natural progression is to go out there to the Omidyar Research Center, where there's a lot of, of data-driven, focused research going on. So um, what I want to kind of do for you is just set the stage for why it is we're all talking about big data and what are some of the really interesting applications that um, you can, can run into when you deal with big data. I think the panel that we just heard from had a lot of really interesting ideas and a lot of interesting motivations, and I just want to sort of second everything that they said. So Moore's Law has really helped us out over these last couple of decades. It's really transformed our society. Um, we are now swimming in a sea of data, and that's really been made possible by the fact that transistors get smaller and smaller, and what we need to store data gets smaller and smaller. A few of the research scientists at my lab just recently announced that they figured out the very smallest bit of matter that you can use to store a bit is 12 atoms. So with only 12 atoms, you can store a one or a zero. This is just uh, leading edge technology today, but you can imagine over the next 10 years or so as that starts to get commercialized, what that's going to mean for how much data we can store and therefore how much data we can generate. So I just wanted to give you some ideas of how much data we are actually swimming in. Today, there are about 2.7 zettabytes out there. And what is a zettabyte? A zettabyte is 100 million copies of the Library of Congress. So we've got 2.7 of those today, and by 2020, we're going to have 40 zettabytes. If you look at uh, data.gov and some of the, the government websites, they're already publishing almost a half million data sets. Walmart alone processes over a million customer transactions every hour. Each one of those transactions is a full shopping basket. So think about how much data that's generating. Every minute, we have 48 new hours of content updated and <coughs> uploaded to YouTube. We tweet more than 500 million times a day, and that little like button on Facebook, 3.2 billion times a day. So think about what that means in terms of data that's being generated and data that's just laying there waiting to be taken advantage of. So just some other statistics is the amount of data we have in the world today is that we're all tweeting three tweets per minute, which is pretty fast, I have to tell you, um, for 26, almost 27,000 years. Or we're all getting millions and millions of MRIs every day. Or 200 billion HD movies, which would take you 47 million years to actually watch. So there's a lot of data out there, and that data is just sitting there waiting for somebody to take advantage of it. And the, the theme that I heard in the panel and kind of the theme that I want to leave with you today is that we're, we're sitting on an opportunity here now to figure out how to harness that data and make use of it. And the, the upside is huge, but the other side of that that I want to leave you with is that it's still a pretty hard problem. These are just some of the examples that we and IBM are working with our customers on and some of the, the art of what's possible. One big area that we've been focused on quite a bit with our retail customers is how do you take advantage of that social media data? How do you take advantage of those tweets and all those Facebook likes in order to learn things about your customer base and your clients? Uh, sensor data, somebody mentioned this morning, is another key piece of, of input data. Uh, 
imagine being able to take all that sensory input data from hospitals, so that you're, you're generating all that data, and combine it with predictive analytics, as was mentioned this morning, so that you can start to detect life-threatening conditions before anyone on the floor, any of the healthcare staff, even has any idea that it's happening. We've actually worked with a, university or a hospital in Toronto where they're, they're monitoring newborns in this very way and being able to uh, detect that something's wrong well ahead of when they were previously able to do it. <clears throat> More sensor data and geospatial and weather data. There's a, a plethora of weather data out there. You can take advantage of that to figure out when to turn the wind turbines on or off or in the case of a storm, figure out exactly where to put the repair vehicle so that you're ready when the, when the snow falls and you've got them all positioned in the right place. There's a lot of financial data that the government just publishes for us for free, the SEC and the FDIC. It's just sitting out there. Imagine combining that information, which is all in textual format, with transactional data, and what are some of the different risk analysis profiles that you could produce by just taking advantage of that data. This last one is a favorite of mine. I have a, a friend who's a police officer in Indianapolis, and he, his job as part of the Homeland Security is to try and detect um, new threats that are facing the city. And he is very savvy. He's on Twitter, he's on Facebook, he's using all sorts of different tools. And one of the things that I sat with him over Christmas, and uh, the words, the pizza man delivers is a key phrase to look for on Twitter feeds because of what it is is announcing a new drug dealer in a particular neighborhood. So you can imagine from <laughs> law enforcement capabilities of trying to pull all of these different diverse data sources together in order to monitor what's going on and identify where the threats are coming from. Okay, so um, the data is out there, but what I also want to stress for you is that making use of all that data is really hard. I really appreciated the debate this morning between Phil and Brenna, between Utopia and open source and the real world that Brenna was um, producing. I'm a soldier in that particular war, and I can tell you that it's still really hard. Um, open source tools are there and they're, they're coming along, but what they're really doing is going after the low-hanging fruit at this, problem, at this point. Um, the harder problems is how do you make use, how do you deal with such a massive scale data? How do you debug a system of terabytes and terabytes of data and there's a null value in the middle of it somewhere that's causing your program to crash? How do you do that? And just, if you ever want to sit with me on a, a daily basis and watch me curse and spit while I try to figure out what's wrong with my program, it really is still pretty hard. But there's an opportunity there for companies like IBM and Microsoft to develop tools and develop the technologies to make it easier. So it's okay that it's hard, it just keeps me employed for a while. So why is it so hard? Uh, there are different aspects to it. And my expertise is in the bottom four, in dealing with data, dealing with the informatics and mathematics, the systems and the graphics and the visualizations. We technology companies, that's what we bring to the table. We can help you deal with all of that data. But what we don't have, which is probably the more important part, is number one, the domain knowledge. What is the hypothesis you're trying to test? What is the problem you're trying to solve? What is it that, what different sets of data that you need to get to, get to bring together in order to solve that problem? So all of these have to come together in order to leverage the content in, in our big data universe today. It just so happens serendipitously that my lab is just today, I'm not up there, um, but we're announcing something we call the Accelerated Discovery Lab, which is to actually go to the heart of that problem of bringing together domain experts with technology experts in order to derive data or derive value from big data. Um, I heard also in the panel today that it's really hard to put the infrastructure together to manage that infrastructure, the software, the hardware, and the expertise, the technical experts in order to deal with all of that data. So what we're doing in the, in the lab is taking care of that part of the problem. We're a big company, we have a lot of infrastructure, software, hardware, you name it, we have it. We've got all of that, plus we have a lot of experts, technical experts that know how to do predictive modeling and analytics, data integration. What our lab is trying to do is to provide the environment where all of that technology and expertise comes together 
so that our clients and customers can come, bring their problems, bring their domain expertise, and bring their data, and we work on those problems together. So that frees our clients and customers from having to deal with all of the infrastructure and brings them in and we can work on these hard problems uh, together. So what I want to do is actually take you through a few of the projects that we are currently undergoing at the lab. These are all in process right now. And what they should do is just give you a flavor for what are some of the, the opportunities that exist when you start to think about big data and how to combine that with, with, with um, enterprise data and small data. So the first one, is all about heavy equipment. So we're working with a mining company in Australia, and they have some very cool toys. They got these giant trucks that can hold 250 tons of material in their in their uh, their carriages, and they've got diggers which can move 50 tons of dirt at a time. Their bread and butter business relies on these pieces of equipment running at all times. A one day downtime costs them millions of dollars. The, you know, 1.8 million in, in terms of the truck, or 5 million in terms of the digger. When those pieces of equipment go down, it's a big problem. And so what they're really motivated to try to do is to prevent them from doing that. So how do you do that? This is, in fact, a big data problem. There's a lot of data that they're sitting on that can be brought together and combined with predictive modeling in order to predict when a particular part is going to fail or if a particular condition happens, what are some alternatives to, um, to take so that you don't have to bring the equipment out of production. You can actually do something, uh, do, choose one of the alternatives that keeps it operating on a daily basis. So they've got data about the equipment itself, the, the, uh, the equipment, its maintenance records, its sensor data, <coughs> unscheduled, unscheduled maintenance, we have that whole stream of data coming in. We've got sensor data both in the, the mining sites as well as on the equipment itself that is giving constant information about temperature, pressure readings that can be brought into a model. We've got business data that, that is modeling what's going to happen if a particular schedule is not met, where a piece of equipment needs to be on a given day. And then there's also weather data that they can bring all together but just having that data together by itself is not sufficient. You really do need to bring the, the predictive modeling on top of that to make use of that data in order to do the prediction. So what we do is we bring all of that data together and we couple it with uh, probabilistic models, rule mining, and predictive models. Bring it all together and out the, the other side of it, we come up with a set of rules and options for a particular condition. In our case, we're actually using this for, my, for the heavy equipment in mining, but you can imagine that it can be applied to many other applications. Not just natural resource companies, but refrigeration, office products, even the, the human body. When that sensor information comes together with a predictive model, you can start to really, uh, really do some interesting um, interventions before conditions arise. Another project that we have ongoing is that we're very heavily into social media. And this is actually one of my favorite projects because I have two teenage daughters who think that I don't know anything about Twitter or social media. They block me on Twitter, they block me on Facebook, they make fun of me if I don't know what's on Instagram these days. And what I'm not telling them is that all of that data is available, and in fact, we license it and we bring it all into the lab on a daily basis. <laughs> so whatever they're tweeting about today, I'm going to have access tomorrow. <laughs> so let's think about what that means in terms of, of social media and analytics. There's 500 million tweets a day, 3.2 billion Facebook likes. What is in that information? It's actually very rich information. People are saying about themselves. They're exposing a lot of information by those little tweets and those little pieces of information on Facebook. For example, if you look here in these Twitter feeds, what can we learn from this very small tweet here? So we know that Ulan, Rizga, and Rama are all friends. We know that it's Rama's birthday. Okay, that's a lot of very rich information there. Can you imagine if it's geocoded, then we also know where they're located. Likewise, 
guys down here, Julie and I are at Matt and Jess's wedding. We know Matt and Jess are getting married. We know that Julia and I are friends. We know that all four of them are friends. And we know this all happened on May 27th. So there's a lot of really rich information that's captured within a tweet just sitting there waiting for someone to exploit it. So you can imagine that that is exactly what's going on, particularly in retail companies today. <coughs> but the data is really vast and noisy. That's just a few tweets. There's just a lot of them out there. How do you deal with all of that information and bring it together to something that's actionable is actually a really hard problem. One of our projects at Almaden is to do exactly that. So what we're doing is taking those social media feeds, Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, all of them, and combining them with psycholinguistic models, which have been around forever, right? You can determine personality traits and habits um, and different characteristics about a person by the way they express themselves. It's not necessarily the words they're choosing, but just the language by which they choose to express it. So it's, it's actually fairly straightforward to take those Twitter feeds in and build up profiles of people and learn a lot of interesting things about them, what their personality is, how open they are to change, even their sleeping habits. So this little pink thing we're showing here is that this guy seems to do a lot of tweeting in the middle of the night. So you start to learn schedules and patterns for people. Okay, so what can you learn from that? where you can learn what products and services are they likely to buy, how loyal they might be to an organization. You can do things like measure an intent to buy. If you're a retail customer, this is actually an important question. I might talk all, about, all the time about buying a Tesla, but do I really have an intent to buy a Tesla? Probably not. Um, you can determine influencers. So within a social network, who is that key person that you need to influence who is then going to go off and influence everyone else in the network? And geographical patterns start to become very interesting. Who's talking about, about what, where, and how frequently? Okay, so these are just some of the, the types of personality traits that we can um, put together in these different profiles. So for example, using the big five personality model to know how open you are, how conscientious, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, um, neuroticism, actually in, in one of the slides I'll show you, um, that you learn a lot about buying patterns based on neuroticism. Um, fundamental values, what's important to you, what's not important to you, uh, what your needs are in a particular organization. And for a particular person, this might be an interesting thing to do, but now think about aggregating that information over a whole community or a whole organization and being able to use that to make for decision making on behalf of that community. So in this particular project, we actually have done this for um, about 800,000 Twitter users, you know, tweeting at different rates during the day. Again, just using these Twitter feeds where you take a 10% sample of all of the Twitter data that's coming in and using that to build up the profiles. This is um, a really cool example of how you can use this information. One of our clients actually had three groups of people. They say, our customers fall into one of three groups, and we know what group they fall into based on the magazines that they read. So if you read O Magazine or Martha Stewart Living, you're in the red group. If you read Parenting or In Style, you're in the purple group. And if you read Harper's Bazaar or Marie Claire, you're in the green group. And based on that grouping, that's how they're going to market to you and how they're gonna, going to uh, uh, assess your needs and wants. So what we did is that we took that Twitter data and we did this trait analysis for that set of, of um, Twitter data. And these are actually for 5,000 followers of those different magazines. And what we learned is that those three groups really don't capture the, the populations very well. It's not sufficient enough. You see they're kind of all over the map here. Uh, the color coding red here actually shows <laughs> uh, so a very strong correlation for people who are less neurotic than others. <laughs> okay, and this is just data that's laying out there. This is just Twitter data that's out there. People have freely given it. They freely said, I follow this magazine, I follow that magazine, talking about whatever they want to talk about. The data is there. It's really all about how do you take advantage of that in order to learn something about your customer base. 
Um, this is my other favorite example. You can take that same Twitter data and start to aggregate it by geography and aggregate it by brand. So what we did in this case is that we were following different retail clothing stores, Hollister, uh, Lululemon, uh, PacSun, um, and just followed their Twitter conversations and applied that same personality trait analysis to it. A um, couple of things that you can learn is that, anybody remember the uh, see-through pant uh, issue that Lululemon had back in March? It actually, their revenue took like 10 to 15% off their revenue for first quarter of this year because they had all of these uh, see-through pants issues. So if you just look here, here's what people were talking about on Twitter on March 17th, the day before these, the, uh, the story hit. And this is what happened the next day, geographically. Who's talking about blue lemon? You see the traffic start to pick up. But then in each one of these little clusters, you can start to see who are the shoppers in that area and what's important to them. One of the things that I learned, I'm a blue lemon shopper. My daughters are Hollister shoppers. I learned that they're way more neurotic than I am. People who shop at, <laughs> people who shop at Lululemon are pretty balanced. <laughs> so, so just think about the possibilities. In this case, I'm talking more about private enterprise and retail companies, but this data is out here and you can use it to learn a lot of different things about different groups of people. It's just waiting there to be exploited. One more uh, example that I have here is all about foodborne illness. Um, the data is there to actually start to track what happens when a particular strain of E. coli gets introduced into the food supply system. So foodborne illness is a, a worldwide problem. It costs a lot of money uh, medically, it introduces a lot of medical costs, but more importantly, the economic losses are, are staggering. When there is an incident, trying to figure out what the right food is and only pull that food off of the shelf rather than pulling every suspect um, different food group off the shelf, causes $78 billion worth of economic losses in a given year. And yet the data exists for us to try and predict more accurately where the particular strain of <coughs> bacteria or whatever has been introduced into the food supply. What this chart shows here is just two types of information overlaid on each other. The blue represents food distribution networks, in this case for a particular food, who's getting what food in what quantity from what sources, and the red are cases, in this case for the uh, E. coli breakout of 2011, where there have been reported cases of different foodborne illnesses. So the data is there. Some of it is public, some of it is private. The food dis distribution information actually has to come from a retail organization. But if you put it all together, what you can actually do is then use that again with predictive analytics to start to, to tackle the problem of figuring out, you know, where is the source, what's causing this problem. So what this slide shows you here is that in the case of the E. coli break out in Europe in 2011, I don't know if you remember that, had to do with some sprouts coming from some farm in Egypt, is what they finally figured out. Um, there were 4,000 cases, 50 fatalities, and it took them two full months to figure out what the source of that outbreak was, and by that time it was over. Right? Everybody who was going to get sick got sick. Everybody who was going to die had already died. So if you take this information, the food distribution information and the reported cases, and you couple that with a predictive model, what this slide here shows you is that after only 41 cases in 18 days, this model is accurately predicting that the source were sprouts. So it would have happened much more quickly. We would have been able to get to the root cause of the, uh, the food outbreak, food illness, foodborne illness, much more quickly and save many more lives. Again, just by taking advantage of the data that's already there and coupling it with predictive models. Okay, you want some more examples? Yes. Okay. All right, anybody here of literature-based discovery? There's this idea back in the 80s by a guy named Swanson who said, you know, what if I just start reading medical journals and scientific literature and maybe patent databases, instead of going into a lab to discover something new, why don't I just read what's out there and try to connect the dots and see if I can solve some problem uh, just by doing that. It's called literature-based survey, 
And he actually was able to do this. He did this by hand, by the way. He was reading different journal articles and scientific papers. And what he determined is that fish oil is something that can be used to treat Raynaud's disease. And why is that true? Because there are a number of different publications out there about fish oil and how it affects things like blood viscosity and platelet aggregation and vascular reactivity. At the same time, there were other papers talking about Raynaud's disease and its relationship to those same characteristics. They're all independently developed and, de and independently published, but if you read them together, you can start to connect the dots and see that fish oil affects these different things in a way that can treat Raynaud's disease. And so that's what happened out of his discovery, which he did all by hand. So now think about where we are now, 20 years later, We've got, we're swimming in this sea of data. Instead of doing that by hand, now we can rely on computers to do a lot of the hard work and, and detect those relationships for us. So we're working with a number of pharmaceutical companies um, who, by the way, they're competitors, but they want to join together on this problem because it is such an expensive problem. The, the act of drug discovery or developing a new drug is billions of dollars and decades of research. So they've come together with us to build this corpus of medical literature, scientific literature, and patent databases, along with the technology around that that allows them to do similarity search across all of these different, these different sources of data. So you can do things like search for chemical structures by similarity based on the drawing of the chemical structure and representing um, different drugs, which might have, for example, 149 different names in the medical and scientific literature being able to coalesce all of that together and understand that it's the same drug. <laughs> and the different representations that you might have for different chemicals. We bring all of that together, again, with a number of models that um, can uh, resolve a lot of these inconsistencies and coalesce all of the information and use that as a form for drug discovery. So what can you yield by doing that? Again, this is now not by hand. This is actually with the, the aid of technology. You can do things like discover in this top picture here, there are five new uses for existing drugs. So there's a chemical compound that's on the, the columns there, sorry, on the rows, and the columns are drug affinities. What that chart is saying is that there are five chemical compounds that are structurally similar to existing malaria drugs. And so these new compounds here are now potential new drugs to treat malaria. It took one week for a set of chemists to figure this out using the system that was bringing all of this data together. Um, and it was a complete surprise to them. They had no idea that, you, that this would actually be a starting point. So that's one kind of discovery that you can make. Another type is to figure out what your competitors are up to. The US Patent Office publishes all of the patents that have ever been filed. Um, and in fact, the worldwide patent database is also available. It's publicly available information. Again, you can apply that, uh, pull that information together <coughs> and apply a model, and you can discover what are my competitors up to. So what this chart showing you here is there are terms in the rows and different companies along the columns. And what this is saying is Genentech is working in an area that no one else is working on. They're very focused in a particular area. Again, it's just the act of bringing this data together and, and putting the right model on top that allows these patterns in this discovery-driven data, so data-driven discovery, to elicit new and serendipitous information. Okay, one more example. Uh, the SEC, the FDIC, they all publish lots of financial information that's out there in documents. There's information about uh, the transactions of corporate officers, there's information about loans and proxy statements, um, annual reports, all of that information is published out on the web very deep inside of text documents. So again, you could go and read it by hand and start to discover patterns, but you could also apply technology to extract the bits of information out of those documents and bring them together. And what that allows you to do is interesting things like track the, the relationships and employment history of corporate insiders. Who was on what board together at what point in time in their history and where have they gone since then? And you can visualize overlapping board members. You know, is there a pattern here for when people move together? Uh, you can do risk analysis. So for example, if you look at loan agreements, 
typically when there's a lot of co-lending going along, one bank is going to be the hub where everyone else is a subsidiary. By pulling all of this information together, you can identify what those hubs are and therefore assess risk. If that particular bank um, has a problem, how is it going to affect the rest of the network and, and the rest of the financial structure? Um, we can also do things like just aggregate institutional holdings. When you start to look at different documents, there are many different names for companies. There's IBM, IBM Corporation, International Business Machines. Trying to keep track of all of that is not something we humans want to do or do very well, but it's something you can train a computer to do very well. And that then allows you to aggregate information that before was very difficult to aggregate so that you can start to see this bigger picture. So it's things like this when we talk about the state of open source tooling versus um, the enterprise level tooling, this is where it starts to get hard. This is where we aren't quite there yet in terms of open source. We'll get there eventually. Um, but those harder problems of trying to do that higher level reasoning and abstraction is really where there's a lot more uh, work to be done, which is great because those are all great research problems for me to work on. Okay, so um, I think I had 20 minutes and I've used up my 20 minutes, so I just want to leave my message with you that the big deal about big data is that it's here, it's waiting to be exploited. The time is right, the technology is here, we just have to come up with the right hypothesis, the right problems, and get to work on solving them. <coughs> Um, and one possible way to learn about that is to work with me at the Accelerated Discovery Lab, lab out in lovely California. Again, the whole idea is we're a research institution. We love to work on hard problems. We've got the infrastructure to work on those hard, hard problems. What we don't necessarily have are the hard problems to work on. So what we'd like to do is encourage people to come with those problems and collaborate with us to work on them together. Thank you. Um, well, at IBM, we don't just have one of anything. Yes. Uh, we have a, a machine learning is a, a really hot area of technology today, applying machine learning algorithms, and there are various different models that can be employed. I see. So you use different AI engines for each kind of problem? Yes, that's just because that's what we do at IBM. We never do one thing one way. <laughs> Anybody watch Ellen? There's this new thing where she just tries to make people stand and yeah. smile yeah. forever. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try that here today. Hold 
Well, you, we're going to do We're going to do it.